I try very hard in this um, address to hopefully share with you some of the things we've done. And you've heard some of the things that, have ha that has happened in the last year that have been somewhat of a phenomenal year in terms of the kinds of things that not only I tried to do, but with my colleagues in the assembly, because it takes all of us to really move, a, move the needle to make a difference for people of California. And uh, so I'm really uh, honored that um, that the speaker is here and a part of what uh, what we want to accomplish tonight. I'm going to try to go through, and I know most of you have been to work all day, and I, I understand, and so have we. We've been on in sessions and on planes and everything else coming home. Uh, but I wanted to uh, to try to give you some overview of the things we've done this past year and uh, and get some sense of where we want to go uh, in the future. Uh, I wanted to make sure that um, that when I serve you, every year we've done the state of the, the district address because so often people get a and you never see them again until they want to be elected again. And I want to make sure that this community is an active and alive community, that you get as much information as possible about what we're trying to do. Um, one of the things the speaker talked about when I was chair of the budget is this issue of transparency. Uh, the first time I went into a meeting about the budget, I would, I, I almost turned over the table. I was so upset because there was no information for us. And I said then, I don't ever want to see this again. I don't ever want to be in another meeting like this. And so when I had the opportunity to chair the budget, it became one of these things that every week I wanted people to go to the meetings. I wanted them to know what was happening. I wanted to know the things that were going on and to really open up the process so that people would know exactly what was happening with the budget. And we did have a relatively easy process because people knew what was going on. There were no surprise attacks in the end. There were no uh, uns you know, surprises that happened that somebody just dumped something in the budget and everybody's furious and running in circles and, you know, those kinds of things. We all knew what was in the budget. We all knew what we were fighting for, and that was important to me. I feel the same way about this district. So often people take advantage of districts that are poor, districts that don't have high voting percentages. And, and 79th has a good voting percentage, has a tremendous diversity. But I wanted people to know that I want to be accountable to you because that's what happens in every other community. And this community deserves no less representation than to have a person who's listening to them. And that doesn't mean I can do everything I want to do and everything you want me to do. But you should know that I'm accessible, that I'm here, that I'm a voice for you, and that my, my staff is also. So I'm, I'm pleased that you're here tonight to talk about the 79th Assembly District. I call this the, the little Florida. Um, because it looks almost like it. But when you look at this district, you see tremendous diversity. You know, this district has some of all the great things that San Diego has. It has two major universities, UC, USD, and San Diego State University. It has uh, the community colleges. It, it deals with Grossmont Community College. It has Cuyamaca Community College. We have uh, Mesa Colleges in this district. So we have some great educational institutions. We have some great kinds of uh, uh, business centers in terms of Mission Valley and Fashion Valley is in this district. Uh, Otai is in this district in terms of the shopping area. So we have some great uh, things in this district. We have tremendous diversity. Uh, there is no majority in this district. You know, there's no uh, majority that's overwhelming in this district. So we have equal numbers of, of communities and ethnic groups and those kinds of things. We have great resources in terms of professional populations. You know, we have the Del Cerros and the Otais. And then we have equally challenging areas in, in Valencia Park and, and, and the Skyline area. So we have some of everything that's good, that's challenging, uh, that provides diversity, and yet at the same time, we have communities that work as communities, that really work hard together to give their communities identity and respect each other uh, in, our com in our district. And so that's one of the things I always tell people, that the 79th Assembly District really is the best district in the state. And I think the others will argue with me about it, but I think I win that argument like I normally do, because this is really one of the greatest districts in the state of California, in its diversity, in its opportunity, its resources, and how would we think of ourselves as our identity, as a small communities that come together, uh, as well as a large community. And so I really uh, am always proud to be a part of the 79th Assembly District and to do the things that are necessary. I want to talk briefly, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call legislative victories. These are some, just some general legislative victories that we did this past year. Uh, we had, had a number of things that we engaged in, a lot of co-authorships we did and those kinds of things. But these were the, sometimes people look at these, these are the hard battles that we fought. And some of you know, they became, some of them became very legendary. AB, um, 329 is the California uh, Healthy Youth Act, which is re really a rewriting of our sex education program. 
to make sure that we were up to date with all of our information on S uh, SDIs, on HIV, uh, looking at issues of self-esteem, talking about positive relationship, talk about sex trafficking, all those things that need to be talked about with young people. And we had had several different resolutions and things to talk about updating our curriculum. This really updated the, the uh, healthy youth, it's called the Healthy Youth Act, uh, uh, that's, uh, that the state has kind of now revised all of it so that there's a standard curriculum for our children. With many of the same rules and regulations about do, can parents opt their children out? Yes, they can, and those kinds of things. But it really brings it up to date. And was, uh, this was one of the major pieces and, and a significant piece that we did this year. Our Foster Youth Services Act, eight, eight, all of these here were signed by the governor, 854. Uh, this act basically talked initially began by looking at the fact that children who live with their relatives get fewer dollars and less support than they get if they live with strangers. And as we try to improve our foster care system, we know that one of the best things is if kids can be with their parents. If they can be with that, not their parents, but their relatives. And so as a result, we last year, we increased the amount because at one point, if you stay with your relative, you made about, you were given almost half of as much money as you would be if you were with a stranger. So last year in the budget, or year before last, we basically uh, equalized that in terms of saying, okay, whether you're with your parent or with your, uh, 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 your relative, rather, or with a stranger, you got the same amount of money because the care was necessary. Then we looked and said, kids who live with their relatives don't don't always get the kind of psychological support and don't always get the kind of school support in terms of tutoring and, and those kinds of things. But, but oftentimes they have the same challenges. So this was an effort to equalize this, and this was worth several million, I think about $40 million in foster care youth. And, this, and the reason why we did a bill in addition to the budget is we wanted to make sure that the language was correct that provided all the services, because oftentimes you give an allocation and then it's left up to uh, the finance office people to divvy up the money and create the rules. And we wanted to create the rules around what, so that the services that were being provided, so that no child who currently had services would lose services. Because there's a way you can do it, and so some kids wouldn't, wouldn't, can, would not keep their same services. And the agencies were concerned that that would happen. And so we then not only did the, the financial piece in the budget, but we also wrote the stipulations and the laws and the rules and regulations for implementation so that all of our foster care agencies were pleased that they would continue to serve but with more resources for the kids that were there. So the interesting, so we passed 850. 54 and that and and it signed by the governor 953 some of you may have heard that's a racial profiling bill of california and that is a um uh that bill is really the first in the nation that requires all uh uh public public safety individuals all police forces throughout the state have to record information on all stops uh all stops that are not related to some criminal activities and so as a result this data now is given to the uh, attorney general and it will also serve as a way of, of helping to improve relationships, helping to improve policing in the state. Uh, and, um, and it's the first in the nation. The governor has funded it this year with like a 20 or $30 million to provide the resources necessary to collect the data. But it's the first bill in the nation uh, to basically deal with the issue of racial profiling. Um, AB 1000 is a student success with San Diego State. And some of you may know that when we have tried to uh, cause tuition not to be increased, individual campuses increase their fees. This is a law that says they cannot increase fees without the permission of students. The students have to vote and approve additional fees that are out there beyond the tuition. And what we found, of course, is when we held fees, we, when we held tuition flat and didn't increase tuition, campuses, uh, some campuses as much as $2,000 a year had additional fees added on because they could do that by simply consulting with students but not being held accountable to students. This says they have to vote and you have to, and they have to approve it. So this would prevent the up and down additional fees that our students are having. And lastly, of course, the Prosecutorial Duty Disclosure Act talks about the fact that if a prosecutor refuses to disclose information that would lead to the innocence of a person, that then the judge has the authority to basically sanction that individual uh, with the bar association and all kinds of other things, as well as disqualify that individual and, and or the office of that 
uh, district attorney from, from participating in that trial. So this is the prosecutorial duty to disclose information act that we had. We had a number of resolutions and some of you see them in terms of the dropout recovery uh, resolution, the Confederate flag re re uh, resolution, as well as the, for first the citizen, the senior citizens bill of rights. And, and this came out of a community meeting where we talked about the budget and our seniors said, but what, what did we get in the budget? And that was a year we got very little, okay, for seniors. And so I went back and said, okay, we got to do some things to help our seniors. And so we began to talk about things like SSI and, and, and other things, but also to create a, a Senior Citizens Bill of Rights Act for the state of California so that they had some rights that we had to respect as, as uh, legislators. This just tells what I, I did this past year. <clears throat> I chaired the Assembly Budget Committee. I also chaired the Select Committee on Campus Climate and the Select Committee on Higher Ed in San Diego County. And uh, in addition to that, of course, I serve on education, the Higher Ed Committee, uh, and appropriations. Uh, it was important uh, that, um, and we talked about the budget a little bit, but the budget uh, is, uh, is what we, I chair the budget on behalf of the, the speaker for the 80 members of the assembly. Uh, and the budget has five sub-chairs underneath me, so I manage the five sub-chairs, uh, as well as work with the Senate uh, committee that had to deal with the uh, conference committee and working with the Senate to make sure that we crafted the budget. I have to remind my members that the governor cannot write a budget. The governor only makes a recommendation. And I have to say this consistently so that our members feel empowered that they're the ones who actually write the budget. We have to work with the governor because the governor can veto the budget, but the governor can't write a budget. He can only put his proposal together as he does every January. He puts together his proposal. Then he gives us a recommendation of how he thinks the proposal ought to look on May 15th after he sees additional dollars. But it's the Assembly and the Senate who actually write the budget. And that's important for my members to understand. Uh, our campus committee on campus climate. Some of you may remember that uh, a couple of years ago there was a racial incident at San Jose State. And as a result of a concern for that, of what was happening on our campuses, because as legislators, we feel that we are responsible for our university campuses and that parents send their kids to our universities and they should feel safe. They should be able to come to those campuses and not be harassed and bullied and have racial incidents or sexual incidents or all kinds of things happen to them. And so as a result, the speaker at that time, John Pettis, formed a campus climate committee and asked me because of my years, 40 years of being a professor, to actually chair the campus climate committee. That committee has met, some of you have attended some of the meetings with it and has issued its initial report and, and, uh, was, and, it, and it's been reauthorized as a special select committee for this past year and the coming year as well. Uh, uh, we've had a number of hearings around the state on the issues of, of, sexual, of, of racial issues. Uh, we've had some on sexual harassment. We had one recently in Dominguez Hills. We've even gone into talk about campus climate with regards to the increase in homelessness on campus and, and food insecurities. And we had that at San Diego State recently. We're preparing now for a hearing on, on freedom of expression at UCLA because of the incidents that's occurring between the Jewish and the, and the, and the Arab communities uh, in, at UCLA as well as others. So we'll have a hearing of that in May, and then we'll have a, an additional hearing, uh, a concluding hearing. So every year we issue a report. Those who are interested can go on our website and find those hearings and attend them. They're open to the public uh, where we can look at specific issues. The Higher Ed Committee, some of you may know that uh, we've been trying to get a, an additional university in San Diego for a while. And uh, the Chula Vista area has given us over 300 uh, miles, I mean 300, yeah, 300 acres of land. Uh, in Chula Vista to form another university. So we've been struggling with that for maybe 10, 12, 15, really I think it's 20 years when I talked to them last. 20 years they've been trying to get a university. But what we've done recently is that we did this past year in SB 81 uh, basically authorize the development of a study on what kinds of universities are necessary in this area and throughout the state. And the first report is due out uh, early of 2017 to figure it out. So we spent $2 million trying to figure out where we uh, put universities you know, we abolished, the, the, the governor abolished the uh, higher ed commission uh, uh, at the state level that used to make recommendations about where universities should be uh, placed, and that doesn't exist anymore. So absence of that, there really isn't, as we've talked about, a clear policy of how do you get an additional university in the state? How do you figure out whether we need another UC or a CSU, and where should it go? Because at this point, we don't really have a policy, we don't have a committee that oversees it. So uh, we've asked the LAO, our legislative analyst office, to basically do an analysis of it and to do that. 
Okay, this is our 2016 goals, and some of these are things that we were doing last year, we're, we're redoing again or having to expand it. One, we're looking at measures dealing with campus climate uh, and looking at the issue of food insecurities, and this will uh, uh, be one of the, the things that we'll be talking about with regards to making sure that the reports that come in are adequate reports and that we as a legislature continue to get reports about campus climate because it hasn't been resolved, and the issues that face, whether it's uh, sexual harassment at, uh, on, at San Diego State and UC Berkeley and a whole lot of other reports we've had or various kinds of racial incidents that have occurred at other campuses still exist on our campus. Uh, we're looking at 16, 17, a preschool eligibility. We did it last year, and it's interesting, it went through all the committees and got held up in appropriations. So now we've gone back and looked at it. We think we've resolved the issue. This had to do, has to do with the fact that we have military families that do not qualify for child care because they count their housing allowance as a part of their, their finances, and therefore these struggling families cannot qualify for state-subsidized child care. So we're optimistic that this year this bill will get through that it will be signed by the governor and that it will be uh, have an impact upon the eligibility of children in child care. We're also looking at a College Student Hunger Act relief of 2016. This came not only out of our hearing, but it really came from, interestingly enough, a student at San Diego State who was volunteering in my office who wanted to know why they, you can't use EBT cards on campus for food. And it was interesting that uh, we didn't know that. So this, this and as we look at food insecurities, because students are saying, you know, we have to go off campus to try to get food, and then we have to go to these machines that charge us $2 and all this other kind of stuff when you don't have money as it is. And so this is an act that would, uh, uh, the college, uh, the EB, would basically make the fact that, that we have to accept EBT cards, the electronic benefit transfer card uh, of low-income Californians who have to that get CalFresh and CalWorks has to be use, utilized on our campuses, and our campuses will have to accept our EBT cards. And so it's a simple thing when you think about it, but, and I never thought of it, but once again, this was an idea that came from a student at the university who obviously was struggling with this issue of how am I going to buy food that's there. We're also looking at, uh, in addition to things, we're looking at ways in which we can support our teachers with staff development and training in order to improve and work to close the achievement gap with that, and we're still working on that bill. Um, uh, as budget chair, you know, we always work with uh, where we're going, and I, and I work on behalf of this speaker to, to basically um, um, uh, craft the budget for her along with the uh, uh, President Pro Tem and the governor and the various stakeholders that we had in, in place. California is in a stronger place than we've ever been before, and uh, we, some of you will attend the budget town hall. We have one every year, whether I'm budget chair or not. We, we always have a town hall meeting to talk about the budget so that you can have an impact on understanding what's in the budget and how you can impact the budget and, uh, and how that budget can serve to basically uh, help us. Uh, we will have a, as our annual town hall meeting in March. Uh, you will all get a notice of it and hopefully you will attend to be able to see what, how the budget is evolving and the kinds of things that might be beneficial. When we talk about budget, everybody likes to talk about what happens in the budget. And these are some of the things that happened uh, in the budget this past year. Um, the Women's Caucus has really been organized and focused on child care. And, uh, and so the good thing is that this, this past year, we've been able to increase child care slots and increase uh, additional resources coming into child care. We're trying to move to a philosophy that every child in California should have access to high quality child care. Not just babysitting, but high quality child care and uh, as well as preschool. Because we, we, dis, we, we constantly talk about the fact that between zero and three, there's brain development that occurs that has a profound impact for the rest of a child's life. And uh, we, if we wait till five, we're missing a tremendous opportunity to get involved with educating our children and to teaching them. And so we're talking about quality child care that's provided, that should be provided for every child in the state of California. Uh, it's interesting when I talk to people about it, because when I go, when I travel around the world, when you're in places like Sweden and Norway and folks like that, Everybody has access to child care, high quality child care, because they believe that it's a truly an investment. And one of the things we've learned that we keep trying to educate our governor about is that all the data says that people who have high quality child care and go to preschool don't go to prison. So when we start talking about our increase in prison population and how do we decrease the prison population, this is one of the easiest ways to do it. 
generally they're on task and ready and, and, and reading by third grade. If, if children are not reading and performing by third grade, they generally will uh, have difficulty their entire life in school and generally will, may not graduate and are generally the best, the, the candidates to be incarcerated. So when you look at that, you say to yourself, we have eight years from zero to eight to make an impact. Zero to eight to, to basically respond to many of the challenges we have as a state and a nation. We have eight years and we have to take advantage of that zero to eight, that those eight years that children are, are there. So that's important. We also want to talk about, we had big increases to school, as I mentioned to you. Um, we spent, we're giving over $3,000 more per student uh, than we've ever had before. And while we're still behind in funding statewide, when one looks at it, you know, that's a tremendous amount to talk about the fact that we now are giving $3,000 more, over $10,000 per child. This also does not include the... Um, the uh, local control funding formula with regards to the grants that are given to children who are poor, who have language issues, that's an additional money that's on top of all of that. Uh, so we've had, and we've given this past year, $490 million to enhance teacher effectiveness and teacher training and preparation. Uh, we gave more to our universities, uh, the UC 25 million, CSU another 97 million, and our community th colleges, uh, 38 million, uh, we're giving them not only Cal Grant money, but they got additional money through Prop 98. And the interesting thing is that I was meeting with the community colleges uh, the other day, and I explained to them that there are very few things that we do that you see immediate impact. Our money given to community colleges, it has an immediate impact. And uh, we had students that were talking about it, but I told them I also have a kind of a barometer in my household with my niece who goes to Grossmont. And for the first time, she's been able to get all of her classes. All of her classes, you know. And it's, and it's amazing how just being able to get all of your classes changes your whole perspective and your trajectory about what your future is going to look like. And we've had so many of our students trapped in community college, not because they didn't want to graduate and not because they didn't have the ability, but they didn't have the classes. And so in a short period of time, all these students are telling me this, I see it, and the students who were at, at the university, at the uh, Capitol the other day, were talking about the fact that now they have classes, that they've hired teachers, they've expanded the classes, they've expanded the number of classes, and our community colleges for once are, are offering the classes that our students need. Uh, our other budget victories, uh, our speaker talked about our earned income tax credit that's going to really change the lives of uh, over 50,000 people who are in poverty and another 50,000 who are in what we call deep poverty. The earned income tax credit, and, we, and we've had several uh, press conferences about it, people up and down the state are talking about it, and I want you to let everybody who you think might be eligible for it before they file their taxes to take advantage of this. Because many folks will see as much as um, $2,500 additional dollars, 2653 additional dollars is the maximum you can get uh, from the earned income tax, state earned income tax credit. And so be sure, if you're filing taxes, be sure to ask your tax person about it because it's extremely important. It, the worst thing would be, would be for us to allocate this money for the earned income tax credit and nobody take advantage of it. People not file for it. People not take advantage and take the money that's there. And we look at this as a way to close the poverty gap because in doing that, it gives more money, puts more money in the pockets of individuals in the community who are struggling and gives them a chance to participate in the economy and help to grow the economy in their communities. You know, I, I, when we had our press conference, I told them as a kid, I didn't know what income was, but I knew what an income tax check was, uh, you know, because that was always good time in the household. I had no idea what income even meant, but I knew when my parents got an income tax return, that was a good thing. And so I think when we look at that and remember those things, it'll be important for us to do that. Um, we've also uh, increased CalWORKS, our support program for CalWORKS, as well as the various services that we have for our veterans that are there. Uh, the governor has proposed a new budget. And his new budget is has um, it's a brighter revenue picture with lots of, with uh, billions of dollars more uh, than we had last year. We had three additional billion at the end of the year that rolled over into this budget this time. Uh, we're looking at uh, proposed spending uh, from the general fund as well as Prop 98 fund, and we're looking at a buildup of the rainy day fund. Some of you know that we passed Proposition 2 that requires us to develop a surplus, a rainy day fund in case of for so we don't end up with a bust and boom that we've had over the last few years. Uh, this requires 
requires us and mandates us to to save some money. And so we are now increasing our um, our rainy day fund uh, by four point five billion dollars this year. That will take us to eight billion dollars in a rainy day fund, so that we won't experience such extremes of poverty, of greatness, and 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 loss at the same time. Um, the governor's budget also talks about uh, securing health care with manage, uh, the managed uh, uh, MCO tax, uh, higher levels of K-12 in terms of uh, resources, as I said before, over $10,591 per student this year, as well as additional money for the local control funding formula of another $2.8 billion. Uh, we're keeping tuition flat. We're increasing our resources going to our universities, CSUs, and our other community and the community college as well. Um, we're also looking at um, uh, uh, money that will go for maintenance of our universities as well as for our state buildings. Uh, this is our the issue of uh, infrastructure, uh, climate change issues that we're talking. We have $3.1 billion in cap and trade to deal with climate issues and climate change issues. Some of you know our, our people, our speaker was in Paris with others talking about climate issues around the world. Uh, we California is kind of ahead of everybody in many of the other states in terms of our policies with regards to climate change. Um, and we're trying to counter the effect of poverty, as I said before, with our EITC, uh, earned income tax credit, as well as our living adjustment for the first time in many years we'll have an adjustment and an increase in SSI and uh, SSP for the aged and for the disabled of California. Um, we have a number of budget priorities, but those budget priorities will continue as they have before. We want to continue to fund our K-12, our community colleges. We want to basically increase accessibility to early education. Uh, women are still working on that because we're not at the level we want to be, and we have to go at to that level. Uh, we want to improve uh, uh, affordable housing for seniors and those in need. Uh, we want to talk about uh, compensation care for providers, and I think Mr. Moore talked about that for those who are disabled, and, uh, and working on what we call maximum family grant. That's one of our main goals this year, to look at the maximum family grant. Some of you may not know what that means. The maximum family grant was passed some years ago that says, um, once you're in social services, if you have additional children, you cannot get additional money. And so what happens is that you have some families who have had other children who are now suffering because they're, work they're operating on a budget for two kids when they have four kids. And, uh, and so that has been a, uh, something that we looked at and, and all the data that really puts families, particularly working w women, in deeper poverty. And so we're looking to repeal the maximum family grant this year. So those are some of the things we've done. I just want to talk about, uh, the, lastly, uh, the things that you do, that we do here locally. Uh, those are things we do statewide that have some impact, but these are some local things. Most of you attend our mobile office hours, and that's something we started three years ago, and now others have followed our lead. And that's because our office is in the state building, and I felt like, wow, it's out of the district, it's away from people, parking is not the greatest, and on and on and on. And so what we just started to do, we said, well, what we'll do is we'll have mobile office hours. And we've had some great partners with mobile office hours in terms of all of our libraries, welcome us into their, their uh, library, our staff goes and they do their work there, and people can come to the mobile office hour and bring issues that they think are important. We we also get an opportunity to basically pass out material on issues like uh, health enrollment and those kinds of things in there. This past year, we started something called the Youth Advisory Council, and I don't know where my little cheerleader is, but uh, she's somewhere, and she's a part of our Youth Advisory Council. There she is, they're pointing at her now. Brianna is a part of the Youth Advisory Council. We have some young people who work with us. And, um, you know, my goal was to, with the Youth Advisory Council, and it's a work in progress, is to empower young people to take my job. You know, I, I don't, I'm not going to do this forever. And, um, and I just want, I want our young people to understand what politics is all about in this district, what the process is about, uh, to have some engagement, to make some, get some leadership training. And so they have, we formed this Youth Advisory Council where they pretty much run the, their forum, they run their activities, uh, they have organized all kinds of, of things and to try to have an effective voice in this community. Uh, during the past year, they had all kinds of topics. They, they talked about Voting Rights Act, and they've done things on human trafficking for them to understand. Uh, they they wanted to talk, and these are ideas that they came up with. They heard about body cameras, so they had a whole workshop on body cameras that they were involved in with the police department and with the community who came out and showed them what the body cameras looked like, and they had, were able to ask questions. Uh, they wanted they want to get involved in recycling. These were their ideas. They heard about the
the, the plastic bag ban. And they were excited and, and enthusiastic about banning plastic because they've had some discussions on that. And so they had a whole workshop on, on what it means to have a recycling program and, and the ban of plastic bags. And they all made shopping bags out of t-shirts and on and on and on. So they had a, a great discussion of that. They saw a, a film called The Hunting Ground that talked about sexual harassment on college campuses. And they had it, they invited their parents, and they had a huge meeting of individuals who came to see. So these young people have all kinds of great ideas. They've also listed all kinds of things they have for 2016. They meet monthly to talk about their issues and to bring speakers in, and they invite anybody to come. And so they, they're growing. They recently had a recruitment effort, and, and they doubled their numbers in terms of the advisory, uh, Youth Advisory Council. One of the things they're looking at, which I think is kind of interesting to me, and we're still working on it, you know, they wanted what is one of the challenges they face? And they said uh, that one of the challenges they face is having restrooms on trolley stops. And I thought that was, I, I don't ride the trolley. How would I know that? And they said, well, if you want public transportation, you have to make it convenient. And they said when they get on the trolley and you want to go to the restroom, you get off, you, and then you go into a liquor store or some store, they make you buy something so you can go to the restroom. So therefore, you know, and so they were talking about this, and they said if you're going to ride all the way from Lemon Grove out to uh, up north to Claremont, where are you going, and you've got to go to the doctor, and you, you, you're you transferring, it's inconvenient. And I hadn't thought of that, and when I mentioned it to the seniors, the seniors said the same thing. It's very inconvenient. You've got to find a restroom. So we've been working on this project to figure out how, what kind of policy we could put in place to actually have restrooms. And I, when I was in Sweden, I saw these huge things in the middle of the street, and those are restrooms, the ones that we bought that clean themselves and things like that, and they have them downtown. So we're looking at that because I'm, I'm looking at, you know, if, if we're talking about increasing people riding public transportation, decreasing our uh, carbon footprint, then we have to make it convenient. So this was an idea that came from the Youth Advisory Committee. So they're researching it, and we're looking to see if we can do something with it. They also want to talk about lockdowns at schools and safety. They want to talk about what nutrition is and better health for them. Uh, they want to know more about the sex ed laws and the rules and regulations that are there. They're looking at drug abuse and what that means and, and how you, uh, to work with young people. They're also interested in, I thought was interesting, home economics. They want to learn to cook and to sew which I thought was weird, but you know, uh, um, which is, but it's great. And so we're gonna look at some, some cooking things and maybe they'll come to my house and make some things and we'll teach them how to cook and those kind of things. But I just thought it was interesting that our young people are interested in these life skills. They also wanna know how to balance their checkbook and how to finances and things like that. So these are, these are all of their, their suggestions uh, that they have. Um, we also have a senior advisory council, and this grew out of the fact that our seniors were feeling a little neglected in the district. They said everybody gets excited over young people, nobody gets excited over seniors. So we formed a senior advisory council, and they've had a number of meetings about the things they want, the legislation they want, the things they want to see out of the state. But in addition, they recently had a very informative meeting on, on ACA you know, and what it is and what all the different plans were and that kind of thing. And so they had a huge meeting. They hosted it uh, at the uh, George Stevens Senior Center and had lots of folks to show up to talk about health care and what that means and what and how you sign up for it and, and all the kinds of things that they had questions about. We also every month have, a, uh, every quarter we have a stakeholders meeting. We just had one the other day. And this is because I am concerned that, that we have health deserts in this community. You know, we have places where all the hospitals are located, and then there's no hospitals. And there's some communities without urgent care facilities anywhere. And so as a result, of when, even though people have now their Medi-Cal card, they're using it more for emergency rooms because there's no place to go in terms of they don't have the physicians and those things. So I meet every quarter with all the health providers in San Diego, and we're trying to develop a plan and a map to talk about health deserts and how do we improve the quality of services in the 79th Assembly District so that they're not all clustered in one area and then whole areas with no hospitals, no urgent cares, nothing, no kind of support and services for people after hours, as well as folks with cards but can't access it. We're also concerned that San Diego is one of such a large um, area without a county hospital anywhere. And most people don't know that. This whole county, there is no county hospital in San Diego. And that's a major concern of mine. 
We also try to salute individuals. We have a salute to women. And last year, our, our honoree was Vicki Turner, uh, one of the major uh, attorneys here in San Diego County. Uh, we take them to the Capitol. We honor them. Uh, it's coming up fairly soon in March. And we're in the process of accepting nominations. So if you want to nominate someone to be the 2017 C. Lachey, uh 2016, our honoree program will take, and the program will take place on March the 20th at 3 p.m. where we not only salute the one woman, but what we've done in this district is we do about 10 women because we not only do the major uh, salute at the Capitol, but then we also break it down and have someone in education, someone in social services, and we may have some of our honorees here tonight. If you know of someone who lives in the 79th who should be honored, uh, for the work that they do in the community. Please uh, get a form tonight, fill it out, because the committee will be making the decision fairly soon. We want to celebrate those individuals who've done so much for us. A year ago, we took the attendance challenge uh, in the 79th more seriously than any other district. We were uh, the um, secretary, of, the superintendent of education, along with the attorney general, talk about the issues of attendance in the state and how many kids don't go to school and what happens when you miss 10% of school. And when you're out of school 10%, you're normally behind and all kinds of things that happen. And that we needed to let parents know that going to school is very important. So we decided in this district, I authored the, the resolution concerning attendance with the Attorney General and the Superintendent of Instruction to take the, the attendance challenge seriously, that we wanted perfect attendance from children. And, and, uh, and so what ended up, we, we, uh, my staff worked with the schools, we, got, we went to schools, we got the message out to our kids. Uh, we ended up with over 600 kids in the 79th who had perfect attendance. Perfect attendance. And, um, and we had promised to do something exciting for them. Was, you know, we, we didn't know it would be 600 kids. But, um, but it ended up so, and so it, these kids came, we honored them. We not only gave them a letter of recognition, I gave them a medallion that honored them for a perfect attendance for 2015. But in addition to that, um, I guess they must have got seven or eight different letters of uh, resolutions honoring them from the, from the governor to the superintendent of instruction, the board of supervisors, the city council, from my office. They all got these beautiful resolutions, a whole package of resolutions for their perfect attendance. And then SeaWorld invited them to SeaWorld for breakfast for them and their families, and they were able to stay there for the whole day. So this was a major event that took place early in the morning, tremendous celebration of these kids. So now we're off at the challenge again, and we're saying to them, go out and find your friends, and let's, let's double the number of kids who have perfect attendance. And so, and this is not when you call in and say so-and-so's not coming today, because you know the district counts that as you being present so they can get money. No, you cannot be absent at all. Okay. If you get close, we give you an honorable mention and say that was really great. Next year, be perfect. So this is we do perfect attendance in the 79th Assembly District, and we'll be doing it again this June. Uh, we do a pro procurement workshop uh, with small businesses and development. We partnered with them around the county, and so we did issues of franchise, insurance permits, licenses, those kinds of things to support and promote small businesses in the district. We also had a labor apprenticeship fair. Uh, we had issues of trying to get young people into apprenticeships, and the labor councils and the groups who had apprenticeships would have these big meetings and two people show up. Okay, and so what we did, we got involved and we went to, my staff started putting it out in every venue possible. We had over 20 different trades that showed up with all of their gadgets and gadgets and stuff and showing people how to do it. And we had over 400 young people who came in on Saturday to see about these trades. Young people and adults who wanted to figure out how to become apprentice. And they got the information, they got those kinds of uh, things. And so we're planning the next one. Jacob, uh, the Jacob Center partnered with us on that event that Saturday. We're working on it again. And we're trying to follow up to see how many have actually become apprentices in this trace. You know, an apprenticeship is a great thing because it not only gives you a skill, but when you enter an apprenticeship program, you are paid. Many of them are paid $17 an hour to become an apprentice. And when they finish the apprenticeship after three or four years, they make $34 and $40 dollars an hour okay so this is a major thing and this is these apprenticeships do not require a college degree and so for young people to not know how to access that in the 79th to me is criminal so we basically got out there and tried to give them the information 
We also try to have community celebrations and we honor a lot of folks in our community. We had our small business of the year, our veterans of the year, uh, our unsung heroes. We had a major celebration of everyone in August in terms of all the various kinds of community celebrations we've had. We have scholarship recipients. I personally give scholarships as well as we encourage our young people to participate in it. The uh, California Legislative Black Caucus gives scholarships and we honored our extraordinary volunteers. And so that's some of the pictures of all the folks who were being honored that, that August. We also honored our, our um, Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, we had a great celebration with food and music and, and the nominations, and we honored a number of our Hispanic uh, members of the 79th. We have our annual health fair, uh, back to school kickoff. We, we had, I forgot, maybe 30 or 40 vendors who were there for a health fair, as well as we had um, as a, for a health fair, but we had over a thousand young people to come through there to get backpacks, to take advantage of the resources, to be tested, to see the kinds of services that were available. And we were at the Jacobs Center for that particular event as well, an entire a day of, of events. Uh, we had our youth job fair. We still have, our, uh, and, uh, and then we had our giveaway. Uh, we gave away turkeys. We gave over 200 turkeys, and I just saw a lot of the letters I got from Lemon Grove School District from the different families who, who got our turkeys during Thanksgiving. Uh, we had volunteers to come who set up all the, the things. We got donated turkeys and food and other kinds of things to give to families. And so we wanted to make sure all the families had resources, and we also had covered California as a part of the efforts that's there. So this has been a busy year. Uh, as expected, and uh, uh, I want to thank, I first want to thank, I don't know what to do with this thing here. Uh, uh, it has all these comments on it. What are we doing? Okay. All right, that's okay? Okay, good. Add notes, okay. Um, I, I just first want to thank, you know, we did a lot of things this past year, a lot of wonderful things to represent this community. <laughs> but I want to thank my staff. I have an amazing staff here and in Sacramento. Uh, I have, I, I, you know, uh, a lot of people go through a lot of staff, you know, a lot of folks running and changing. I've been blessed to not lose any staff. Uh, in fact, um, you know, uh, they want to stay, and, and like I said, I've had some who volunteered for a year, a year and a half before I could even employ them. And uh, I'm really grateful. Lee is here, is one of my staff. Janelle Jackson is here. Uh, is Denise here? Where's Denise? Is Denise? I don't know if Denise is probably in the back somewhere hiding. There, Denise is in the back. And then you know, Lachey is my district director. These, this is the local staff that's here, uh, as well as I did. I said Janelle Jackson. Okay, okay. Uh, as well as a host of other wonderful volunteers who help out in the office and work. Uh, we often have student interns. I'm not sure if any of the interns are here, but we have students who from San Diego State, from Community College, who work in our office because we want to give them the experience of what it is to work in the legislature. Uh, I have a great staff in Sacramento as well in terms of my legislative staff, my community staff. My chief of staff is Lisa Martin, who is an amazing woman. Uh, and so I have wonderful staff. We are, are very happy that this year we're, we're taking forward a number of bills. Some of you have know that we're taking forth a bill that has to do with um, uh, solar panels on people's homes and appraisals. That came out of Broadway Heights. Broadway Heights community has a lot of solar panels on those homes, and when they get their houses appraised, they don't see any value in it more than the people across the street who don't have them. And so as a result of that, we they came to us and worked with us, and so their bill just passed out of the assembly and on its way to the Senate. Uh, and so we're excited about the possibility of taking an issue that they had, a really important issue uh, that uh, is significant not only for them but statewide, and to carry that bill for them. So once again, thank you for the opportunity. I'm going to open it up for questions. Questions? Yes. My good friend Sue Braun, school board. Yeah. Um, Shirley, I love what you've done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wish every, and I love your future goals. I wish every assembly person would just go to you, listen to what you have to say, and, <laughs> and everything would be good. But um, I'm wondering your take on the governor, the governor's early childhood education law grant eventually and what um, we can do to help um, whatever you think is best. Okay. Um, also, personally, as well as the legal and public education committee. Right. And also, in, in that same vein, um, can anything be done to lower the family income that's needed to qualify for state assistance for early childhood education? 
couple years ago that uh, income level was raised and a bunch of families got knocked out and that was really sad for yeah. those families. And the reimbursement rate, I know a lot from the mm -hmm. but with the adding of slots, but the reimbursement rate is still low. Um, you know, all those issues are still there. You're absolutely correct. Uh, I think the first year when I was in the assembly, uh, we issued a resolution on behalf of child care. And, and, and in that were a number of those issues that you raised and that we put forth to try to continue to work on. Um, you know, the governor has proposed to put together all of these things in one block grant thing. And um, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not that excited about it because, you know, the, the local control funding family thing that put everything in one big block has not worked that well, okay, because you end up with things that people don't do uh, based on their priorities, and sometimes the reasons why you have these programs broken out is because they're, it often leaves out certain people, certain kids, and so uh, it, it, it's not the matter of whether it should all be together. It's a question of how you're going to do it and one, what, what standards are you going to put on it to make sure that every child who normally gets child care gets it. So just putting everything together is not a solution. That's number one. Number two, he's given no more money for it. See, so the issue is we need more money. We need more money and more slots. And so that's the real challenge. There's no more money in it. It's putting it all together. And I'm not sure what the standards are and what have you. So I'm not really in favor of putting all this stuff together uh, without clear upfront goals and objectives uh, that need to be there. Um, we, the, we've been working on the family income grant for a while because we have a lot of folks in who, are, who actually work in the assembly, who work in people's offices, who can't afford child care, cannot afford it, which is, I mean, I've had people on my staff working on the child care issue who can't afford child care. I mean, you know, so at some point we've been trying to work on it and trying to get a different kind of scale that would, um, kind of provide support for folks at different levels. Um, and we know the reimbursement rate is low, so we're working on that. There's going to be a major hearing on child care by the Budget Committee in, uh, in the, I think it's the end of February, February 24th. And I'm chairing the committee as chair of the budget in Sacramento. There'll be a major hearing on child care uh, because we want to look at it because of the fact we've given additional resources to, the, to child care. The question becomes what impact has it had and have we really solved all the issues that are there so we can understand this complex issue as we move forward with some specific goals about where we want to go with child care. So we're having a major hearing in Sacramento on the 24th and I think the groups here have been notified of that hearing and there'll be some folks attending but everyone is welcome to come to Sacramento for the child care hearing on the 24th. Okay? Any other questions? Yes. Hi, Dr. Barber. Uh, my name is Jay Steiger. I am the District Advisory Council Representative for the Parent Group in um, the Mesa Street Mountain School District. And I want to first Good to see you again. You and Steve Atkins for meeting, or your offices for meeting with our Superintendent Brian Russell recently. This is in regards to um, charter schools, chartering in districts that are chartered by another district. And we recently have had an issue with a local charter school that has some serious financial issues. Um, and I just was wondering if you could potentially give a few words on both ideas on better financial accountability from the charters and potentially um, putting some more regulatory levels in for charters, making it not impossible, of course, for them to come in under a district that they are not chartered by, but at least adding extra layers of oversight and accountability. I know Rosemont High School District has had issues with this, mm -hmm. as have San Diego Unified. Right. We have, a, we have a bill on my desk now to talk about chartering and authorization of charters. And um, it's somewhat, it's, it's a little bit more complicated at this point, but we're working on it because it is a major issue. Um, you know, my, my pers perspective with regards to charters is that um, the local district that charters that, that makes that charter should be responsible for that charter. And what the problem is, is that we had one 
small district of like 1,200 kids that had 25 charters, and none of them were in their 20, 25 charters. None of them were in their own district, but they were making money on chartering because they got $3,000 per charter or something like that. So we had to we had to clamp down on that. And so, but but really, the responsibility of the charter ought to fall to the the, the agency or the 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 school board that charters that charter. And if you and and there should be some standards with regards to whether or not you have the internal resources in terms of structural resources to basically support the charter. And and that to me that's important. Uh, we have a charter here in San Diego that's become that's gotten in some difficulty. The good thing is that the school board locally recognized that and has gotten involved in it. It's in this local area here. They've gotten involved. They've got their financial people working on it, they've got their curriculum people working on it, and they're working with the parents of that of that charter. Unfortunately for most parents, they go to a charter, they, they don't know where it came from. They go to it in La Mesa, and they think it's La Mesa Unified, La Mesa Spring Valley School District that chartered it, and they didn't. They just, they just appear there. And so it is a problem, we're working on it. Um, Actually, the Charter Association uh, statewide is actually in favor of additional regulations because oftentimes when those things happen, it's not a part of the main association. It's kind of an offspring that's doing it and, uh, and, and causing them difficulty. Uh, so the California School Charter School Association is really working to, with me to create some legislation and some additional rules and regulations to make sure that those things don't happen. So we're working on it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a... And our governor is now really in, very interested in changing charter legislation, which I can understand because he doesn't want to open it up so that those who don't like charters start trying to destroy them. But at the same time, there's a need for some additional regulations, and we have some, some legislation on my desk to look at concerning that. We may, we may author it this year or more than likely maybe next year. We've been asked to carry that bill. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Uh my name is Christian Gorecki. Uh I'm the chairperson for the Senior Advisory Committee for the City of San Diego. It's called SOP. Uh, of course, I've with Mr. Cole and Marty Emble's office. I've been there for like six years. And uh, I retired a uh, police officer. And I've been here since 1969. So I took this responsibility from Jerry Sanders. But your best is growing population is seniors. And so <laughs> that's a little emphasis is put on seniors. Exactly. I have new programs and everything, and I have been to every senior center in San Diego, and that's my job, that's my responsibility. Right now we're in San Diego. It's appalling. Seniors. Uh, isolation. Nobody to talk to. Food, no food. Either I mean, animal food, whatever they pet food. Transportation, they can't go any place. Communication, how can you tell a senior to come to a meeting when they don't have a, a iPhone or whatever that to get the information out? And I, I didn't know about the fourth district. I was on that board over there for a while. But is this the same that if you to bring it to governor, that the seniors are the fastest growing population there is in the state of California. And they're a little overlooked. I can tell you that for a fact. I've been out there. Mm -hmm. Until it's time for voting. And everybody wants to come out and I need my constituents. They need to vote. Please. And they come out and they vote. But they don't get no results from government uh, municipalities, and I know that for a fact. So it's a statement of concern that if you can, you know, get together. I mean, I, I'm in San Diego, so San Diego District, I live here, but I'm talking about the sure. city. Look at the well, we do. You do have a um, a strong advocate in Sacramento, in the name person of Cheryl Brown from San Bernardino, who talks about the senior tsunami and how fast the senior population is growing. And so she consistently raises the issue. I've raised the issue. That's why we did the senior uh, bill of rights. Uh, that's why I formed the senior advisory committee because uh, it has been a piece that's been overlooked. And um, I, one year we had great proposals for um, seniors in the budget, 
and the governor lined item all of them out except for a couple of million dollars. So it is a major issue. Um, I say to him all the time, you know, you're a senior, you're more senior than I am, and uh, you should support these activities for seniors. Uh, and it is a growing population, there's no question. That. Cheryl quotes the statistics all the time, and so we're looking at that. Even more recently, um, Ms. Gonzalez had a bill that dealt with um, not taxing diapers for, uh, for, for infants under the age of two. And and Ms. Um, uh, Cheryl Brown raised the issue of what about uh, uh, senior uh, needs and, and diapers and things that are there that they should not be taxed as well. So I think she's looking at how she can work with her to modify that because we just forget about them uh, that are there. Uh, and uh, or else we think they're, that the only need they have are, are medical needs rather than other kinds of needs. So it is an issue. It's brought up regularly. We continue to fight for it, try to increase it. The SSI this year, uh, the increase in SSI is, uh, is one of the things that we tried to do last year and we finally got it this year in the governor's budget. So we're raising the consciousness of that of, of the fact that, that there is a population that needs to be heard. You do have a senior legislature. I'm sure you, I don't know if you're aware of that, but there's a 79th representative and they meet and they raise these issues. But I think there needs to be a, 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 a greater cry. You know, there used to be something called the Great Panthers, which were seniors, and uh, we may need to reactivate the Great Panthers, who basically argued for uh, certain kinds of things that are there. Um, you know, we tried, even with an uh, education piece in terms of educational uh, packages with regards to seniors and, and um, adult education, trying to make sure that the seniors had access to that, and that was kind of eliminated by some individuals because I felt very strongly that uh, the seniors of the state of California have worked all their lives to provide K-12 education, university support for everybody, and as they became seniors, we should at least allow them to have classes, you know, and so that, a lot of those were eliminated from our, our senior packages. As well, so we're still working on it. It's no question. We uh, we have not done all we can for our seniors, and we have to. Okay. Any other questions? We have time probably for one more, and I promise to get you guys out by seven. And so, good to see you. Yes, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, one of the questions that our council had is we're looking at University Avenue, and we're curious about if any of all the dollars coming forward that can assist bringing more jobs and businesses to University Avenue. I know you're in a great position to see uh, what funding you might have to enhance the community. We, we don't do redevelopment, you know, but yeah. Transit oriented development, cap and trade, and uh, California competes for right. all you know, so we, there are some resources, and hopefully they will take advantage of it. We don't do redevelopment, quote, unquote, but we have other resources, and we'll make sure that they do it. I didn't emphasize one thing that happened in the budget. When some of you know Choice Creek is a very important creek in the city of San Diego, and that the Jackie Robinson Y is going to build a brand new Y in that community that's very needed, and we put $6 million into the Jackie Robinson Y to mitigate the impact of Choice Creek. And everybody in the state now knows Toyas Creek. Everybody wanted, what the heck is Toyas Creek? And so some of the budget staff came down and looked at Toyas Creek to see our famous little creek and support for it as we do the Jackie Robinson Y. Let me first of all thank all of you for coming. I really appreciate it, um, you being here tonight and for our annual meeting. You'll, if you, you're here and you signed up, you'll continue to get our notices and those kinds of things. I want to thank our speaker for being here, uh, Tony Atkins, who's been a great great speaker in the assembly. The first speaker from San Diego in the history of California is Tony Atkins, so we're really excited about that, and she's provided us some powerful leadership in a lot of different areas. Um, I also want to thank Doug Moore for welcoming him into his house. Uh, it's good to be here. And. Um, and all of you for coming tonight and sharing your evening with, with me. Uh, there are some refreshments in the community hall. Please join us for refreshments. And once again, thank you so very much for coming. And thank you for the honor of allowing me to serve you. Thank you.